I'm an assistant coach at Hinton and a head coach of some things. And uh, a head coach comes in and he looks terrible. He just looks just awful, awful, awful. I said, dude, I said, man, I got this. You go ahead and go. I'll take care of these boys. So he leaves. He calls me about 30 minutes later. I have the flu. Okay. So I had the boys for four days. Um, the fourth day or third day rolls around and my wife sends me a text. And I thought this was funny. She sends me a text and she says, I can't get Paisley out of bed. Paisley's my first grader. She's the cutest little girl in the world. You love her to death when you meet her. You're going to just absolutely love her. She's the cutest little girl in the world. My wife says, I can't get Paisley out of bed. So I go into teacher mode and coach mode. I'm thinking, you're the grown up. Get her up. You know, you're the adult. Get her up. Tell her to go to school. So I call and tell her that. She's like, she's sick. We take her to the doctor. She had strep and flu. So I'm just like, oh, great. You know, it's going to go through my whole house. It's the way this always works. But at this moment, no one else has had it. And then I woke up this morning. I was like, okay, my stomach hurts. My head hurts. I'm not feeling good. I'm like, this is going to be the moment. The week I have two tournaments and our first three high school games. Like, I'm worried it's going to kick in. But um, uh, two songs that uh, just kind of have been going through my mind today. One of them, um, I absolutely love the uh, the song, um, uh, the guy that sings Chain Breaker. Uh, I'm just a no um, – What's the guy's name? Anybody help me out? Zach Williams. Should have known that. <laughs> Being Zach and all. Uh, but he has that song out right now. It's I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Man, I love that. I've heard that in my PE class for just weeks and weeks and weeks now. It just always sticks out in my mind. And whenever I get to come here, I just want you to know that's exactly how I feel every day. I'm just a nobody. I'm just some guy that's getting to come and just talk about Jesus. And anytime I get the opportunity to do that, I always want to take it. Uh, so, um, you know, I get to come back next Sunday night, and I'm excited about that. I get to do this today, and then next Sunday I get to preach in my home church, and uh, just real excited about that. And then um, at the same time, um, you know, this week I've had a lot of stuff going on, and uh, I've been preparing this message for uh, just hoping I get to come back here for the last couple of weeks. And uh, a lot of it's about parenting. A lot of it's about um, just being a godly example. And we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. But as I've, have you ever had one of those times where you just felt like you weren't worthy to do something? Have you, maybe it was serving God. Maybe it was serving man. Maybe it was just serving in a community or just doing something. You know, um, when I was a head high school coach, I remember having a season where, you know, I go to state and the next year I have like four wins. And I'm like, man, I just don't even feel worthy to coach these kids. You know, that's how I kind of felt. And, uh, you know, sometimes we just feel like that unworthiness. Well, as I prepared this and I've, I've worked on it, I felt like this is what God's wanted me to talk about. Um, I've had some circumstances in my life with my own family and my own kids and stuff. And I just felt like, man, I'm, and, and coaching the kids I coach, I just felt like, man, I'm unworthy to talk about this. But you know what? When, and, uh, you know, if God tells you to do something, you go do it. And that's just been one of the, one of the things in my life that I've talked about frequently. But, um, you know, a couple of days ago, I just felt like I'm just, I need to just change this sermon. I need to just do something different because I'm just unworthy to talk about this. I'm just not doing a very good job at this or that or whatever. And um, as I was thinking that, a Mercy Me song called, came on called, uh, I think it's called Even If. Uh, and he's just talking about, uh, his name Bart, Bart, Paul, Bart. Miller, Bart Miller, in the song, when he wrote these lyrics, he's talking about going out and doing these concerts. He's talking about going out and praising God and doing these Christian concerts. And some days he just doesn't feel like it. <laughs> and I think we can all relate to that. Some days we just don't feel like it. Maybe we may not feel like going to work or just living the life we need to live. We just don't feel like it sometimes. And I kind of, that was hitting me, but I was just like, you know what? God's called me to do this. I'm going to go do that. And uh, the more I just heard that song and praised God with that song and just went, I let that song just kind of be my, be my direction the last few days, I was like, man, it just got me excited to be here because I feel like I'm just getting to push through and do the thing that God wants me to do. So before we start, uh, I just wanted to just share that with you guys. That's kind of the background for my week or last couple of weeks. Just I felt like I've had everything happen to me to pull me away from here where I could have just called in and just said, I don't even feel like it today. Uh, but you know what? When God calls you to go do something, you go do it. Uh, you know, I'll just piggyback off that. The year that I quit coaching and decided to teach at Anadarko, um, I had the best team that I've ever had coaching in my life. I had a group of girls that we lost two games that season, and they're junior high kids, and we're going to have a great high school team coming up. And I felt like God called me into ministry. And, uh, you know, I went and became a youth pastor and just taught third grade. And uh, I told those kids all the time, um, the, the, my basketball team, I was like, guys, you know, I told you I'm going to be for, here for a long time, but God called me to go into ministry. And uh, when God tells you to go do something, you go do it. 
And, uh, you know, there were tears and, you know, we thought we were going to win, you know, we talked about winning championships together and doing this and that and everything. And, you know, but when God calls you to do something, you go do it. And that's how I feel about this, this uh, message today. So before we start, I want to do the same thing we usually do. I just want you to take a minute just to bow your heads. I want you to pray. I want you to just give God thanks for today. Give God thanks for this month. And um, um, just pray for me, for my body just to feel better and just to deliver this message according to God's will. Okay, will you bow your heads? God, you're awesome. You're wonderful. You're great. Thank you for every individual in this room. Just thank you for this season where we know that you sent your son to just be born of a virgin and just just live this perfect holy life for us to set an example for us and then dying on the cross for our sins. Let us not forget that that's the reason we celebrate Christmas, Lord. Let us not forget that there's a lot more to the story, Lord, and that, that, that you are in control and that you are awesome, wonderful, and great during this time, Lord. Just pray that you'll be with us during the service. Just bless us, love us, guide us, direct us, and let's just have an amazing week for you. In Christ's name, amen. So, oh, um, you guys have heard me talk about this before, where a lot of times, and I think even said the last time I preached here, um, I, we talked about sometimes we hear this part of the story and we stop there and we're like, oh, you know, I know that, but there's more to it afterwards. And uh, that's what I entitled this story was, um, if you go to Luke chapter 2, uh, the beginning of that from 1 through 21 is the birth of Jesus. And, it, and you guys have heard the story. You guys heard what, what happened there. And, um, you know, but the rest of this from 22 through 52 is um, a couple of more stories about the birth of Jesus and the, what happened right after his birth and things like that. And if you have, um, I have these little um, flyers, if you guys want to fill them out. If, um, did everybody get one of these? There might be some more in the back, if not. Um, but I like to take notes, and this is just, you can kind of fill in the blanks with this to uh, help you out. But, um, you know, a lot of times we get through the birth of Jesus, and we're like, okay, the, the wise man came, we're done. You know, and that's it. And they're like, that's all we talk about this whole Christmas season. And there's more to the story than that. And, uh, and something that uh, we're doing kind of cool in my Sunday school class. That's why I was running a little bit late to, later today than normal, I thought, was in my Sunday school class, we we're reading the book of Luke. And if you start on today, December 1st, chapter 1 is, you know, every day read a chapter of the book. So today, read chapter 1, tomorrow, tap, chapter 2, 3, 4. On Christmas Eve, you'll get through the whole book of Luke. So uh, that's what we're doing in my Sunday school class. That's what we're doing with our adult Sunday school group right now. And that's just something that you guys can do that's a real easy way to just read the whole book of Luke and get through the whole story of Jesus in this month. But um, so anyways, when I was kind of prepping for that a little bit too, um, I came across this and it says, when the time came, I'm going to read it this way. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Jesus has been born. The kings have left. They, this is actually 40 days past um, the birth of Jesus. As is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be consecrated or dedicated to the Lord. So um, after 40 days, Mary and Joseph are taking the baby to the temple and they're giving him to the Lord. It's a baby dedication service. How many of you guys have ever been to a baby ded dedication service? Man, I'm telling you, I went to one of the coolest ones ever of these a few months ago. My niece, um, she, uh, and I have a great niece and, uh, they were at Faith Church in Hinton, and they do this thing with marbles at their baby dedication service. And there's X amount of marbles. I don't remember how many they say are in that, but it's just, just, it's just in this one jar. And in that, they say, if you were to take one marble out every week from now until they're completely empty, it'll be the day of that child's graduation from high school. And... That, and they say, you know, if you were to do that, so, you know, one, you know, they talk about just kind of losing your marbles, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's all, it is. you know, as you go on, you're like, oh, my kid did that, my kid did that, and you're just losing your marbles constantly, but, and they joked about that, but at the same time, you're like, that's not that much, that one jar of just small marbles is the same amount of time you have to be with your child. So they were actually, it was the same, same thing, I love baby dedications, I've done the same thing with my own kids, and then, um, 
you know, it was neat to get to see that. But this is just the parent, uh, Mary and Joseph are taking Jesus to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. And it says, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, if you're going to go back into the Old Testament, what Mary and Joseph are actually doing here also, whenever someone gives birth, just like when someone had leprosy or someone had an illness or someone had a sickness, or if someone had sinned, what did they have to do? Purification. They had to make a sacrifice of something. It either had to be, you know, depending on what it was. Well, according to having a baby, because you were considered unclean, you had to sacrifice a dove or um, a, young, a pair of a, a dove or a young pigeon. And then also they sacrificed a second one to cover the sins of anyone who had been in contact with you for those 40 days. And that sounds strange to us, but that was church to them back then. That was what they did. So for 40 days, anybody that came and saw Mary and the baby during that time were considered unclean because they had been around somebody who was unclean. So that's why they went and did these sacrifices. And it says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel uh, and the Holy Spirit was on him. And he had been revealed, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, you have promised, you have the promise you have made, I'm sorry, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Oh, went too far. There we go. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many of Israel, and the sign will and this uh, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And uh, there was a prophet, Anna, and the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then was uh, and then was a widow until she was eighty four. So with Anna, she was married for just a few years, probably as a young teenager to early twenties, and then her husband passed, and she remained unmarried and serving God until she was eighty four years old. This is an amazing thing because a lot of times, if you go back and you listen to the walk that Jesus is walking in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you hear stories about someone being married multiple times. You hear stories about people who um, are widowed and married to somebody else. Or in their customs then, a lot of times whenever someone died, they were actually given to, does anybody know? Yes, the brother. So if my wife died, that poor woman, she'd have to put up with my brother and his family and their kids and like pile all into that family because that was according to their customs. But this woman didn't. She, was, she became a widow and served God with the rest of her life, which is a beautiful thing. Um, she left the temple. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying for, you know, 70 years, 60 years. Coming up to them at the very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required of the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. And again, I just think this is a beautiful story. Mary and Joseph were doing the things that, that, that godly parents do. They were taking their kids to church and following the customs there. They took the baby, Jesus, and dedicated him to the Lord. And, you know, I was telling someone about this um, just the other day, and they thought it was kind of weird. They're like, why would you dedicate the Lord to the Lord? Because Mary and Joseph were doing what God's called them to do. Uh, you know, and it just kind of, you know, it's just one of those odd things. But they're doing what God's called them to do. They're following the traditions of the church. Um, the boy Jesus at the temple. So now we're going to jump ahead from baby Jesus at 40 days old and jumping ahead to him, him being about 12 now. Okay, there's a big gap there. But again, 
Notice this is all in chapter 2. The birth of Jesus to 12 years old is all in the same chapter. You know, a lot of times, you know, when the Bible was divided up into a chapter, at one time it was all just one scroll. It was all just one script. And then, um, you know, the church got together and they, they broke it up into scriptures. They broke it up into verses so it's easier to memorize and learn. Um, and I just always think it's interesting. That's a huge gap. You know, if you think about it, Jesus' ministry started when he was 30 years old, and they have three years into, you know, in Luke, 24 chapters, or 20, it'd be 22 chapters. But the rest, but that little piece of his life is all, that big piece of his life, zero to 12 years old, is all in just two chapters. But anyways, chasing rabbits. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, when he was 12 years old, they went to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. So Mary and Joseph had lost Jesus. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled for a day. So they didn't just lose him. They lost him for a day. You know, it could be 24 hours, could be 12 hours. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him. So Jesus had been lost from his mom and dad for three days at 12 years old. Can you guys imagine? I talked to some boys in here that were third graders a minute ago and a couple of fifth graders. Can you guys imagine as parents losing your you know, 12-year-old? What's that now? A fifth grader, sixth grader, probably? Can you imagine losing your sixth grader in... Oklahoma City during the busiest holiday season, during Black Friday and all that stuff, and you lose them at 12 years old. Pretty terrifying, right? That's kind of what, you know, we talk about Black Friday being a crazy time. You know, this is a time when all the people were going back to uh, Jerusalem to, um, to celebrate the Passover. Every single Jew in the Middle East at that time, everybody is walking that way. So it was like a Black Friday on steroids at this time. It wasn't just the mamas going out and shopping, the mamas, the daddies, the kids, the uncles, the cousins, every baby all the way up to the elderly. If they were Jewish, they were walking to Jerusalem at this time for the Passover. It is like the Super Bowl times five. So uh, when it comes to the crowd, and your child is lost in that moment. So, after three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers, talking about the boy Jesus. Oop, went too far. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. Um, his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. You know, um, I've been to so many churches over the years where, you know, there's a painting of this story. How many of you guys have ever seen the older paintings of the boy Jesus standing in the temple courts and he, like, has his hand up and, like, all the teachers are around him, like, laying on the ground listening? That is the exact opposite of what this picture is supposed to look like. The exact opposite. Guys, if you were a teacher of the law, and you guys can probably remember seeing a Shakespeare play of... Um, Socrates or a Shakespeare play of, um, oh my goodness, what's the other one? Where, anyways, um, where there's a teacher in the court standing up and he's talking and he's speaking to everybody and everyone else is just kind of lounging on the ground around him or there's stadium seating up around him like that. Jesus is not the guy who is teaching in this moment. He is the guy that's asking rhetorical questions back to him. He is actually the kid who's sitting down there on the floor just like a student should, learning and listening and, and taking all this in from all these people. And then he's asking questions, and they're going, wow, this guy's got it. This kid's pretty bright. You know, I like this kid. There's something about them. Guys, teachers have favorite kids. You guys that are in school, teachers have favorite kids. I hate to tell you that. I'm a teacher. I'm a coach. I have favorite kids. They're the ones that usually do what's right and know all the answers not the ones that back talk and, and not pay attention or like the kid who fell asleep whenever, whenever um, Paul was preaching and the kid fell out the window and he died and they brought him back to life. I mean, probably not your favorite kid if you know your preaching put him to sleep. These teachers are looking at Jesus just going, wow, this kid's got it. This kid's something special. Now, another thing it says, when, G when his parents saw him, they were astonished. 
they were astonished because after three days of losing your click kid at Black Friday, parents, how would you feel in that moment? Relieved, excited, astonished. I can't believe I found him. We thought he was dead. Guys, he could have been sold into slavery. He could have gone to anywhere. He could have done so many different things, but he was in the temple courts worshiping, and his parents were astonished that they'd found him. He said, and Jesus replies, why were you searching for me? He asked, don't you know I had to be in my father's house? Now, when he said this, this when you go back to Greek and you go back to Hebrew and you can, you can figure out, you can read the actual language, this is not a, well, I had to be in God's house. That's my job. This is another rhetorical question. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? I mean, mom, where else would I go? I'm not going to go down to the brothel. I'm Jesus. I'm not going to go over to the, you know, roll dice and cast lots with those guys down there. Where, from the way you've raised me, where would you think I'd be? I'm going to be at the church. I'm going to be in the place where you've raised me and taught me to be. This isn't a, I had to be here. This is what you forced upon me. He's, it's a rhetorical question saying, why are you surprised that, it, you know, why didn't, it's kind of like, those, why didn't you just look here first? <laughs> Have you ever lost your keys and you're like, I can't find it. I've looked everywhere. I've looked in the couch kitchens. I've looked here. I've looked there. Oh, they're on the key ring behind the door. <laughs> That's how it was. Jesus is like, well, duh, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. And it says, then they went down to Nazareth with them, and he was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And I, we're going to talk more about this later, but Jesus grew in favor with God and man. I think it's one of the most beautiful scriptures, beautiful phrases that I've ever heard in the Bible, and I never noticed it until about three weeks ago. When I was a kid, I had a guy that used to tell us, and, and again, he was a pastor, and I'm sure you may have said it. I'm sure you've had other people say it. I've, had this, I've said it to me, I've had other and I've said it to other people. Who cares what they think? Oh, if you're doing what's right, it doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't. This, guys, if we're living the right kind of life, we're going to grow in stature with God and man. You know, I had so many pastors over the years. I've had so many youth pastors over the years. I've had so many people in the church say, you live for God and forget about everybody else. If you live for God, it doesn't matter what they do. If you're living for God the right way, you're going to grow in stature with God and man. If you're doing it right, kids, you know, you can't grow in stature with God and man if we're doing the things we're not supposed to do. Adults, we can't grow in the stature of God and man if we are living a life for God on Sundays, but then cheating people out of things on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. When we're living for God and doing it the right way seven days a week, we're going to grow in the stature and the praises and, the, and a godly life in front of man and God. So we're going to have favor with man and God. And I just thought that was beautiful because so many times we just, we do one and not the other. Either we go out into this world and we live totally for man and we disappoint God, or we live totally for God on Sundays and we disappoint man the rest of the week because of the way we treat them. And, you know, Jesus lived a life from 12 to 30 that... He grew, uh, he grew favor with God and man. So we've got five lessons I want to go through real quickly with you guys. Lesson one, godly parents will set godly pathways for their kids. So if you want to take notes, you can fill in those blanks. Godly parents will set godly pathways for their kids. Verse 22 says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn be de male be dedicated or consecrated to the Lord. And then in verse 41 also, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When, they, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. Guys, Mary and Jesus, when God said, you're going to have my child, you are gonna be born of a, you're going to be a virgin, you're going to give birth to baby Jesus, he chose godly parents. He put this baby into her womb and said, I am entrusting you because you are a godly family. And because of this, um, Jesus had the, Jesus, I'm trying to think of the right way to word this. Godly parents and ungodly parents are setting the pathways for their kids every day. You guys have noticed how generation after generation after generation, 
it re like this you've heard the cycle repeats it doesn't matter what that is it could be divorce it could be drugs it could be alcohol it could be you know whatever but if a lot of times if grandma did it this way then the kids did it that way and then their kids did it that way and the cycle just continues on and on and on and on um it goes that way for the church too it goes that way for the families in the church. Um, I read a stat the other day. If mom goes to church, there's a 7% better chance that your kids will accept Christ before they're of the age of 18. If kids go to church on their own without parents, there's a 3% chance that they'll accept Christ in their life and stay with the church past the age of 18. And then the statistic for adult, if the father of a household takes their family to church, it was like 87% of families, the children, the wife, the everybody accepts Christ and continues within the church. 87%. That's a giant jump. That's a giant gap. But it's one of those things where God, like I said, godly parents will set the godly pathways for their kids. Guys, if you want to have your kids around good kids, send them to youth group. Are they perfect? No. <laughs> I've been a youth pastor. I've seen some horrific things and heard some horrific language. Are they perfect? No. But it's better than being out in an alley somewhere else doing something else they're not supposed to do. If you want your kids to be godly kids, make sure they're in church on Sundays. Make sure they're in church on Wednesdays. Read the Word with them. Get into the Bible with them. Pray together as a family. We have to set the godly examples for the next generation of kids. Oh, the wrong way. Lesson two, parenting is tough even godly parents will make mistakes. And this is the point where I was telling you guys earlier. I, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm out with my high school team the other night, and my wife sends me a message, and of course it's one of those, you will not believe what, and I've got four kids, so I'm going to say one of your kids did today. <laughs> and I'm like, she tells me about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm about, I'm about to go preach about being a godly parent and doing these godly things. And, and I'm like, my kid did that? Are you kidding me? And then like two days later, my other kid did something worse. I was like, are you serious? Like, this is, this is when I was like, man, I think I should change this up. I don't feel worthy to talk about this. But parenting is tough. Even godly parents will make mistakes. Um, so Mary and Joseph have walked a day back, thinking Jesus was with them in their company. He traveled a, they've traveled a day. They began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Oh, go back. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to and asking their questions. Raise your hand as parents if you've ever lost a kid. The truth. <laughs> so most parents are raising about this high. I'm going to tell you two quick stories. A couple of years ago, I've, I've lost two kids. Like, I've got four kids. I've lost two of them. Um, a couple of years ago, we went to an ag banquet, and we had to sell, and uh, we had all this leftover food, and they were like, hey, take it to the church. You know, I'm the youth pastor. Take it to the church, and y'all can have it at for supper tomorrow night at youth. I'm like, awesome. That sounds great. So I get these, these – there's multiple big tubs of, like, baked potatoes and brisket and all this stuff, and we drive down to the church, and I get my first pan. I was like, Levi, come help me. I take it in, and I have to, like, unlock the door and go to the fridge and, like, do all the, you know, the church is, like, a long ways back there. I get the first pan. I come back. Levi, I said, come help me. I get my second pan. There's, like, eight pans. And I come back all by myself again, and I'm, like, and I've got, like, my two little ones, my wife, my daughter, and everybody's helping. And I'm, like, oh, my gosh, Levi, get off your phone. Get out of the back seat. Let's go. He's not in the back seat. So about that time, another parent pulls up. Hey, you forgot one. I'm like, yeah, great dad of the year moment for me. <laughs> so I'm losing my cool and losing my temper because I'm like, this lazy teenage kid is just not helping me. Why is he not helping? And he wasn't even there. So uh, that was one time I lost a kid. Now the other time, um, it's when I uh, uh, this is when I, this was the scare, most scared I think I've ever been in my life. Um, I lost my four-year-old about a week after we moved to our new house. Okay, um, we had 20 acres at Binger, and Titans four, Paisley's three, and it's the middle of summer. We just got moved there, um, and um, the pa we had 20 acres, and the pasture was like six foot tall. The people who lived there before us did not take very good care of it. The weeds were really tall, and I didn't have my brush hog yet. So what I did was I drove my pickup around this one little area so I could get from point A to point B, and then I used my mower and just kind of chopped it down. You know, I set it up. And so I had this one path around in like a little half square where I could get to like the edges of my fence line I needed to. 
And um, so anyways, the kids want to fly a kite. I'm like, okay, cool. I get two kites out. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. We got one kite out. So Titan's flying the kite. Paisley's there. Paisley goes, I'm cold. I'm like, okay, my three-year-old's cold. So Titan, you ready to go inside? And he's four. He's like, no. And he just kind of pulled on the kite. And, you know, my house is only about from here to probably David back there. And not very far at all. And, but, again, the weeds were really tall. I couldn't see. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to take Paisley in, and then I'll come right back out. So I go over there, take her in, and do a couple other things. I open the door, and I look out, and I see the kite flying. So I'm like, okay, perfect. He's still right there because I see the kite. Don't see the kid. I see the kite flying. So I go a little longer, and I wait. Probably about 10 minutes later, I finally start walking back out there. And I see the kite there. I'm like, okay, great. The kite's still there. And I walk around, you know, big tall brush here, cleared path right here. And I walk around the corner there. He had tied the kite to the chair I was sitting on and took off somewhere. And again, we're on 20 acres. There's brush everywhere. So, you know, I run this way along the path. Titan, Titan, where are you? Titan, go along this way. Can't find him. He's not hollering back. He's only like four, almost five years old. Titan, Titan, come on. Where are you, Titan? not hollering back and I'm like okay did something come out of the brush and get him you know I just moved here I don't know what's around here and I'm going all over the place and I mean 20 I'm like almost about to call my wife on the phone who's at work because I'm a teacher I have summers off she was working at a bank and be like I lost a kid <laughs> so oh my gosh you know I'm about to call her and I go back in the house and he went and laid down in his bed and went to sleep <laughs> apparently kite flying was so strenuous on a four-year-old he had to walk himself back inside and go to sleep <laughs> Losing your kid is scary. I cannot imagine losing one of my children. And again, I'm on 20 acres, just us. I had little to worry about. But I can't imagine losing one of my kids during the Passover with all of that stuff going on, with millions of people walking around for three days. We're going to make mistakes as parents. That's one thing that I've, I've taken some joy in this week about with all the parenting mistakes that I've made in my life and, and will still make in my life. We're going to make mistakes. But you know what? God's going to take care of it. Oh, went the wrong way again. So parenting is tough. Even godly parents are going to make mistakes. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes as godly parents. All parents make mistakes. We just got to trust that God's going to take care of them in the process when we do. Lesson three, when we raise our children in God's favor, others will see a difference. And the child grew, this is verse 40, so this is after the baby dedication, uh, and at the temple it said, And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. And then 46 says, after, th go back. after three days they found him. We were just talking about that. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. There we go. So on this, on the third lesson, it's when we raise our children in God's favor, others will see a difference. Guys, there's this kid that I just love at my school. And I talked about having favorite kids. This kid is just an awesome kid. She's one of my fourth graders. She's on my basketball team. If that kid gets knocked down, she helps her up. If something bad happens, she's a positive kid. She'll build them up, talk positive to the kids. And, you know, I see her at church on Sunday morning sometimes, or I've seen her in youth group when I've gone to help and, sp and help and speak with those guys and stuff. And she's praising God during praise and worship. And she's raising her hands. And again, this is a fourth grader. And you know what? She's the youth pastor's kid out there. She's been raised in church her whole life. She's been, t she's been raised a little differently than my kids were raised. She's been raised a little differently than a lot of other kids are raised. And I look at that kid and I just go, wow, there is something different about that kid. She speaks life into everybody around her. She speaks positive things into every human being around her. And she is just an amazing kid. And I have a lot of kids like that in my life. But I just look at people like that. When we raise our kids in a godly home, in a godly family, in a godly church, in a godly community, people will see a difference in them. People are going to look at them and just go, there's something different. I want to be like that. I want my kid to be like that. I want my kids to be around that so they'll have life spoken into them. You know, we're going to see something different in those people, in those kids. Lesson four, godly people must speak life into this world. I kind of paraphrase this and summarize it, but um, it says, now when there was a man in Jerusalem, I'll go back so y'all can see. There you go. Godly people must speak life into this world. 
Godly people have got to build up. Godly people have got to speak life into those around them. Kids are getting torn down all the time. Kids are looking at things they don't need to look at. Kids are being berated by insults and being demeanored and all those things. It's our job as the godly people to speak life into these kids, to speak life into our neighbors, to speak life into our spouses, to speak life into our families because not many other people are going to besides us. You know, I... Uh, you know, I've, I've, I see, I read my kids' messages on Instagram, and I, I see the things that other kids have sent to them, and I see the things that, you know, I have kids all the time come and talk to me and say, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so did that, and I mean, I have kids even complain about me to other kids. I'm like, yeah, that's my job. I'm a coach. Not everybody's going to like me, but we as the adult Christian people have got to speak life into those around us. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout. Simeon took the baby in his arms, and he praised God, saying, You have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of all your people of Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about them. You know, they could have stepped away and just, I mean, he could have said, you know, your baby's going to die for all mankind. Your baby is going to be thrown up on a cross. Your baby is going to be nailed to it and bleeding and dying, and you're going to watch it all. You're going to see it all firsthand. Instead, he was saying, they, he built them up, and he said, this is how amazing your child is going to be. You know, I, you know I'll, I'll tell you guys something I say all the time. If you were to ask my students um, three things I say frequently, one of them is be smart. <laughs> you know, I don't say you're dumb. <laughs> I don't say you're stupid. I say, guys, just be smart. Make the right choices. Do the right thing. Be smart. The second thing that they'd probably hear me say is, you're awesome. I say it all the time. Kids are perfectly and wonderfully made. They are made in the image of God. You are awesome. I was uh, coaching softball one day, and uh, we went to a convenience store, and I had a girl. Uh, she's actually one of my nieces. She didn't do very good that day, and she's bummed, and she heads down on the ground just moping and everything else. And I, I said, hey, you know, you're awesome. We're at a convenience store on our way back, about halfway back from the town we went to. I just said, hey, you're awesome. Gave her a fist bump. Coach House, I suck today. Exact words. Not, I mean, the word for word. I said, doesn't matter. I said, you're awesome. No, I'm not. I mean, she's arguing with me. I said, you are made in the image of Christ. You are perfectly and wonderfully made, and there's a plan and a purpose for your life that he's put in you. You are awesome. And she goes, anyway, she's like, thanks, Coach House, and just walked away. And the cashier lady looks at me, and she goes, that was good. <laughs> I was like, what? She goes, what you just said to her? I was like, Okay, you know, I didn't think anything about it because I say it so often to kids. It's just common. We have got to build kids up. We've got to build our communities up, our families up. We have to speak life as the church into our community if we want something great to happen here. Um, you know, I tell my son every day, his name uh, and, uh, and daughter, you know, I'll say, you know, hey, Titan, you're awesome. Just out of nowhere, just random thought of the day. And he'll just, okay, Dad, you're awesome too. Like he rolls his eyes because he's heard it so much. I'm like, no, no, Titan, you're awesome. I know, Dad. You're awesome too. And then he tries to go play because, and, and it's just one of those things where I, you know, we must speak life into this world because there's a lot of things that there's a lot of things being spoken that's not life. And then lesson five: living a godly life is more than words; it's an action. Living a godly life is more than words; it's an action. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. And Jesus, and then that was that was whenever he was the baby. And then Jesus went down to Nazareth with them, Mary and Joseph, and he was obedient. Jesus was obedient to his mother and father. And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and men. Guys, Jesus could have walked around this earth just saying, Hey guys, I'm the Son of God. Look at all these miracles I'm about to start doing. Look what I can do. But he lived a life where he was growing in the favor of God and men. And here is the key word on both of these verses I want you all to check out. Verse 40, he was filled with, what is that? Wisdom. Verse 52, Jesus grew in wisdom. Guys, that's what it all boils down to. If we get into the scripture and we start learning about God and we start growing closer and we listen to the Holy Spirit and we let the Holy Spirit direct our lives, we are going to be a lot wiser than just doing this thing on our own. If Jesus had to grow in wisdom from the day he was born until the day he started his ministry, don't you think we need to go out and do the same thing? That's why we need our quiet time. 
That's why we need a Bible study. That's why we need the Word of God being instilled into us every single day to help us choose the right and wrong thing to do, to help us. That's why we need Proverbs. That's why we need to read through our Psalms. That's why we need to study the Word of God because we need wisdom poured into us every single day. If Jesus had to grow in wisdom and the stature, so do we. And because he did so, he grew in the favor of God and man. And that's what I said starting this thing out. When we leave today, ask yourself this question. Are we growing in the favor? Are we having favor with God and man or just with man? Are we doing things in our lives that are just pleasing to teenagers and they making them happy and displeasing God day in and day out? Are we living a life for God on Sundays where he's like, he looks at us and goes, man, I can't wait to bless that guy or that girl and just love on them and just give them all the blessings I ever want to. But then on Monday through Saturday, we go live a whole different kind of life than what we're living on Sundays. When we live, when we seek out wisdom every single day, we're going to grow favor with God and man. If you look down at this paper, it says challenge of the week. Take a few minutes to reflect on the things you can do to be a godly example to those around you. It might be praying more with your kids, reading God's word together, as a family making a commitment to join the church, joining a Sunday school class, going to Wednesday night light, Wednesday night services, or sitting down together for a meal and giving thanks. Whatever it is, set a godly example for those of you around, those around us. Guys, we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to have a... Time, an altar call, we're going to have a time where we can just pray. And if there's anything that you need to get settled with God during this holiday season, there is no better time to do it than now. Maybe you've never accepted Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. Maybe you have never, maybe you have and you've trailed away a little bit. Maybe you just want to join this awesome church. We're going to have a time where you can do that. Maybe you just want to stand in your place and just pray for the people around you. That's great. But as we dismiss here in a few minutes, just take a couple of minutes and just pray and think about how we can leave these doors today and live a better life and bring honor and glory to God and then have others just see you and want to be a part of this too. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the many blessings you've given us, Lord. We thank you for just being the incredible, amazing God that you are. We just pray during this time, if there's someone that just does not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, that you will just... Just move in their hearts, Lord. Just move in their lives and just have that uh, courage just to step out of the aisle, Lord, and just just be amazing here, Lord. God, if there's just somebody here that just may not just be living quite right, the life that they know that you want them to live, Lord, just pray that we'll just rededicate our lives to you and just know that you are in control and that you are awesome and that you are just the greatest blessing. You are putting the greatest blessings on our lives that we ever could have, Lord. Just thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for this holiday season. Thank you for every individual in this room. In Christ's name, amen.